Okay, stand by. Three, two. The surviving generations of the Holocaust, based in Seattle, Washington, has taken on the project of videotaping eyewitness accounts of the Holocaust from those individuals who survived the Nazi reign of terror. Millions of people were annihilated just because they were Jewish. The goals of the project are, one, to educate the current and future generations about the Holocaust with the hope that those who learned what happened will not allow it to happen again to any group of people, two, to refute false allegations by neo-Nazis and revisionist historians that the Holocaust never occurred, and third, to refute the commonly held notion that the Jewish people offered little, if any, resistance to the Nazis. The voices of the dead are silent. The voices of the survivors must live on forever. My name is Sandy Samuel. Today I am interviewing Fred Kahn, a Holocaust survivor. Mr. Kahn, in order to put your experiences in perspective, I would first like to ask you some questions about your life before World War II. What is your full name? My English name is Fred Kahn. My German name is Fritz Kahn. When and where were you born? I was born in Germany in a small farming community, Laubenheim and then now. That's very near to Bingen am Rhein about half an hour's drive to Frankfurt. Uh, when were you born? I was born on May 25th, 1924. Could you describe the town you came from? Like oh. I said, the town was a very small community. There lived about 600 people, and we were the only Jewish family in this small farming town. Um, did you have any relatives who lived near Laubenheim? Yes, I, I had uh, grandparents and uncles who lived about a half an hour's distance by bicycle from this town. What were your parents' names? My father's name was Moritz Kahn. My mother's name was Erna Kahn. And when were they born? My father was born on October 11th, 1985, and my mother was born on August 21st, 99. Okay. Did you have any brothers or sisters? I had one, I have one brother who is still living and he lives in Chicago today. And, and what is his name? His name is Eric Kahn. And is he older? or? He's young? three years older than I am. So he was born? He was born in 1921. What kind of work did your family do? My father was a butcher, his profession was a butcher, and he also uh, dealt uh, with um, uh, cattle. And my mother, she operated a small grocery store in this community, and we also had a post office uh, in the community up there. Um, had, your fa had your family moved there? Um, oh, they lived there for many, many years. It's how would you describe your family's standard of living? Oh, I would say middle class. What kind of public and religious education did you receive? Uh, not very much. Public, uh, I went to school until I, for seven years. Then I was, Jews weren't allowed in school anymore and I was kicked out. And that's all the education I had. Later on, I, uh, for one year, I was in a special uh, school. What, um, religiously, where was your family religiously? Um? There was a synagogue about three miles away in a, not a smaller community. There were about 12, 15 Jewish family living there in this community. And they all gathered there on holidays, Saturdays. And my grandfather, I remember him. He was the candor in this uh, synagogue up there. Um, was your family an observant family, or was it more liberal? Uh, no, I would say observant. My father was more observant than my mother was, but I would say all in all, observant family. 
Uh, what kind of relationship did your family and you have with the Gentiles in your community? Well, like I said, we were very much uh, liked in this community. Uh, we did a lot of favors to the farmers. Uh, we had our only grocery store there. We supplied them with food, and sometimes they had money to pay for it, and sometimes they didn't. So my mother waited for the money till the harvest came in. Uh, it was mostly a, a wine community, mostly wine farmers up there. Did and the harvest was only once a year, so during the summer months, uh, people ran short on money there. Did you experience any anti-Semitism in Lauenheim before the war? Before the war, yeah, up until 1936-37, hardly anything. But uh, it really started in 1937-38. Uh, what happened? Well, there was the famous Kristallnacht in uh, November of 1938. That was the first time my father was arrested, and also I was arrested for the first time. I was very young then. And uh, some windows were broken out in our house. There came a, uh, a truckload of uh, SS men. They stopped in front of our house, and they wanted to come in. And did the looting and, and smashing from the furniture and windows and so on. And the Burgermeister from this small town, he came and he protected us. He said, uh, this man uh, was in the First World War. He received the Iron Cross. He fought for Germany. And uh, I won't let anybody go in this house. Do you remember the Burgermeister's name? Yes, his name was Schnell. Uh -huh. And your and your father had been in, in decorated in World War One. Yes, he was decorated with an Iron Cross in the First World War. Where was your brother during all this? My brother, he went to school. He went to uh, uh, engineering school in Bingen am Rhein, which was about uh, five kilometers from our small town, and uh, he got. An, he didn't receive a degree, and in 1939, he immigrated to the United States. And uh, then he joined the Air Force, United States Air Force, and he fought in World War II. So he left your family behind? He left the family behind, right. Um, how, did, how did your neighbors react to what was going on to well, you? Well, you know, at... Uh, they didn't, couldn't talk to us anymore. They didn't uh, greet us anymore with hello or whatever. Uh, and then we decided to move from this small community. Uh, and we moved to Cologne. When was this? That was in 1939, in uh, early in February, I believe it was. In 1939, we moved to Cologne. Uh, with a, impression that we wouldn't be recognized. Cologne was a big town, and uh, nobody knew us. And my father, he was 70% disabled from the First World War, and he had a pension, uh, which the Germans still paid. And uh, that was the only income we had. And then I, uh, one day, read an article in the paper in the newspaper where someone was looking for a young man who wanted to learn a trade and also make money at the same time. I answered this ad and I was hired to lay uh, hardwood floors. And I got along pretty good with this man. This man knew I was Jewish, but he says, you better don't tell anybody that you're Jewish. You say you're an Italian, you have dark hair, and you look like an Italian. And if somebody speaks to you or asks a question, you just make us, if you don't understand German, just don't answer him. Do you remember the man's name? His name was Dismont. It was his last name, Franz Dismont. And he was in one-man uh, operation, so he had a motorcycle. And he picked me up from my home. Every day I went to work. Uh, 
I had to work very hard there. And one day he got a job in the um, train station, in the Cologne, in the main tra train station to lay the hardwood floors, which were laid in uh, tar. And an SS man came up and talked to me. And I made off because I didn't understand him. So he asked this uh, Franz Dismond if this fellow is Jewish. He said, oh, no, no, he's not Jewish. He's an Italian boy. Oh. And he walked away. So I worked there for approximately a year, and I learned some of the uh, hardwood floor business. And a law came out in Germany where Jews couldn't work alone anymore. They only had to work under supervision, 10 people or more. So I was hired by a, uh, a company which built barracks for uh, the German army. And this company's name was Schlottmann. And uh, I worked there. I helped build the barracks for about a year or so. So when was this? About? That was in 40, 1940. Were you 40, 41. Were you at all involved in anything Jewish or Zionist during that period? Uh, yes, I come to this in a minute. And uh, so uh, uh, I worked there for a while, and then I had a chance to uh, go to Hashara. That is, uh, Hashara means uh, they prepare you for uh, to go to Palestine and Israel. And there they taught us, uh, um, first of all, Ivrit, how to speak the language. <clears throat> and then um, they prepare um, for uh, uh, the agriculture, milking cows, and um, taking care of horses. Where was this? And that when was, was it? in Havelberg, called Havelberg, and that was by Berlin not very far from Berlin. And how did you wind up going there? Uh, I uh, volunteered to go there. That came up because my parents, uh, they saw that it would be the best for me to go there to, with the uh, idea later on to go to Israel, which is Israel today. And uh, I was there for approximately a year, and I was very popular, and one day, uh, the transport was uh, being prepared to send uh, to Israel, and I decided against it not to go because I didn't want to leave my parents alone. So I went back to Cologne. The transport left without me. I went to Cologne, and I went back to the same company I worked for before. I got this job back, building barracks. That didn't last very long. That was in 1941. And one day we got notice from the Gestapo uh, to, uh, to prepare ourselves. They gave us two weeks' notice that we uh, should pack our suitcases and we could not sell anything that was in our apartment. Everything had to stay the way it was. We couldn't sell anything. We couldn't get rid of anything. Only one suitcase per person we could take along, closing. And that was in uh, December the 7th, 1941, where we had to report early in the morning on the train station. Besides, there were about 1,500 other people from Cologne who had a report with us. Uh, the train came, and uh, we had to go in. The train took off for three days, and we didn't know where we were going. No food, no water. Uh, one time, we received water, and that was in uh, way on the east in the east part, eastern part of Germany, where the train stopped and we could get some water. Was it a passenger train? It was a passenger train, right. And after three days, this train stopped. We didn't know where we were. And there were uh, uh, quite a few SS people surrounded the train and also 
Later on, we found out it was in Latvia, Latvian police also, Latvian SS. So uh, they told us everybody out of the train, and we had to stay in line, and then uh, the SS came and said, anybody who isn't able to walk or who would like to have a ride, because there was a walk of about two, three hours from the train station, um, they could get a ride on a, on a, whatever it was, whatever they transported us in. So my father, he says, well, I fought for this country, I'm 70% disabled, I'm going to go and take the ride, and you can walk. And I told him, no, you're not going to go any place, you stay right with us. I said, I don't sound right to me. Uh, so we had to walk through a small gate, all the people, and there were two SS men standing, one on each side, and they had boxes right next to them. They said, the suitcases, you have to leave on the train station, you could carry nothing. And anything we had on us, watches, rings, money, jewelry, whatever it was, we had to drop in the boxes. And they told us right away, if we find anything on anybody, they're going to be shot. So we disposed of everything we had, and we went on the march, and it was very cold this day in December in Riga, and finally we arrived uh, in the ghetto. The ghetto was a, oh, a bunch of houses, uh, which was about city blocks, I would say about 15, 20 city blocks with uh, barbed wire surrounded and um, guards standing all on the outside. We walked in through the main gate and then we noticed some people laying on the side, dead people, but we didn't pay much attention to it. So they said, you go to any house you want, wherever you can, uh, each family gets a room. But by the time we were all in this ghetto, uh, there wasn't enough room for everybody. Then about three, two, three families, four families went into one room. After we got in there, we found food on the table, food on the stove, uh, and we looked around, clothing laying all, all over. We went outside to some of the streets, and then we saw dead bodies laying there. And closing on the streets, blood, puddles of blood on the street. Uh, and we found out that uh, that was Latvian Jews which were killed a couple of days before we came. Some of them, they couldn't get uh, rid of some of them, so they were laying around. So we buried some of the bodies, and the closing uh, we put on the side the food which was standing in the houses, in the particular house where we were in, there was a pot of soup. The fat was on top of it, so my mother, she went ahead and lit the stove, and we made fire in the stove, and we heated up the soup, and we served the soups, and finally, we, uh, on the end, on the bottom, there was a di uh, diamond ring laying in the soup. So we saw right away that they must have taken the people out by surprise. And we looked around <coughs> on the streets, and we found more. Uh, jewelry was hidden, and uh, silver was hidden in the garden we ran across. So my father said we should look around, maybe we find some more. Maybe that will save our lives later on. Maybe we can buy our way through. So there was a big barn, a huge barn, and I was pretty athletic inclined. And I walked up and way up high, and I found a sack of uh, gold with gold pieces. There must have been about 120 to 150 pieces of gold in there. Um, there was Russians and then. American dollars and uh, Danish crowns, whatever. And we hit this where we were, and that uh, 
later on. It helped us somewhat, and we'll get to it, this in later on. Uh, for several weeks, nobody came in this ghetto. We didn't know what to expect. Uh, no, we saw no SS, nobody came around, only the people on the outside, the ghetto who stood guards. Who stood uh, guards? The Latvian, uh, Latvian SS. How old were you at this point? I was about 16 then, 16 years old. Uh, so, uh, uh, So for a few weeks you were pretty much left alone? Yeah, we were left alone there and no food came in. But we had enough food because we went through some of the houses which were empty now. There was no ghetto attached to it which we weren't allowed to go in. But that was prepared for later transports which arrived. But at night we walked through the houses and we found potatoes and things. So we had enough food there to eat. And after uh, about two, three weeks, the SS came in the uh, ghetto, and there was an over Sturmbannführer. He uh, introduced himself as uh, Krause. My name is Krause, and I'm in command here. And uh, you all obey my orders. Uh, anybody who uh, don't obey, or we going to be shot on the, on the spot. Uh, there's no, we don't kid around here. Um, so, and then he appointed a, uh, one person who was in charge of the whole ghetto. And he was from Cologne also, because we were the first transport. I should mention though, in the meantime, several more transports came in to the ghetto. After about a week or two, uh, there came people from Dortmund, there came people from Bielefeld, uh, from Hanover, from all different cities all together. We had about 12 transports in there, and uh, each transport was way over a thousand people. And uh, there were more than 100,000 people, I would say between 100 to 120,000 people in this ghetto by then. And now, then the SS uh, appointed a fellow by the name of Schulz, uh, Robert Schulz, who was in charge to put uh, people in different columns. Uh, to go to work. This was a Jewish man. This was a Jewish man, right. And he also was from Cologne. The Col the, I should say the transport from Cologne was the first transport to get into the ghetto. And usually, uh, later on, we found out whoever came first, they had the best uh, jobs in, in the ghetto. And uh, I was appointed as a carpenter to do repair in the ghetto itself. I didn't, I wasn't selected to go outside of the ghetto on a commando. And that went on, the columns left in the morning, women, men, children, and they came back in the evening. Now they were in touch with uh, Latvian uh, private uh, people. Uh, like we found the gold and silver and, and jewelry, so did everybody else in the ghetto. And, and people did have uh, merchandise to, to trade with the population outside of the ghetto. Now, the SS was aware of this and became aware of this. And in the evenings, one evening when the columns came back, they all had to stop on the main gate where they came into the ghetto and they searched every person. And anybody who had anything on themselves brought into the ghetto, they took them out and they shot them right on the spot. So people disposed of it and right in the, in the main gate, the, before the main gate, you could find anything you wanted on this particular day. And people were very careful what to do afterwards. There was a little uh, trading going on, but not like in the beginning because everybody was afraid when they come in that there was a search 
before the people went into the to the ghetto. Uh, one day uh, I was approached by this uh, Schulz, and he said, uh, "Fritz, uh, uh, I think." Uh, we have to find out which one is a good working commander and which one isn't. I think for one day you should go uh, to work and let me know when you come back in the evening uh, what type of work it is and uh, how hard the people have to work so he could organize that elderly people go to commander where the work wasn't this hard and younger people went on different uh, harder commandos. So I did this for a while, and one day I happened to go on the harbor in uh, Riga to unload a ship. And I guess I never will forget this. That was shoes for the army. Now, they took a pair of shoes and tied them together, each pair. The left and the right shoe was tied together, and then they all were thrown into the, to this, um, uh, train, and we had to unload, and we, we tried to take the shoe, we couldn't get them apart. So what we did, we tore them apart, and them shoes never fit. Then they came out, they never fit, because they were all bundled up together. And another time I had to unload hay and straw for the, for the army. And then I came back, and I told them what it was, and what each commander was, the better ones and the, the worst ones. So one day the SS came inside and he says, um, all people, young people, the ages from 16 on up to 30 years old, they all have to come out and stand uh, uh, for an appeal. And they looked us over and they sent us out to a smaller camp, which is called Salas Pils. Where was this? That was by Riga. That was another camp. Now, Salas Pils was a camp. The first people who went there, I wasn't one of the first to go there, but one of my friends by the name of Hans Behrmann, he got selected with the very first selection, and he went there very, very early. Uh, his father, he was uh, in charge of the bread, to give the bread out to the people in the ghetto. And one day he bribed an SS man, he gave him a bunch of gold and asked the SS man where he is going. And he told him, I'm going to this camp Salas Pils. So he asked if I could go along and help him to uh, take the bread there, and if he would bring me back. So he said, yeah, that's fine. So he took the gold pieces, and I went in the back of this uh, truck, and the truck came on in Salas Pils, and I saw my friend Hans there, and he says, whatever you do, don't come in this camp. That's the worst I ever saw. He says, people, uh, they die like flies. He says, there is no... Uh, uh, barracks to live in. We have to work 16, 18 hours a day. We have to build the barracks, and it's ice and snow, and we haven't got nothing to eat here. So I gave him a bread, and I left, and I got back to the ghetto, and I reported what I saw, and I tried my best not to go to this camp, but one day I was selected, like I said, and I arrived in this camp, and this Hans, my friend, came, and he says, I told you not to come here. How come you come here? And I told him, you know, I just was selected, and I had to go. I couldn't get out of it anymore. So uh, we did our best. We stuck together. There wasn't much food. We had to uh, care of boards and lumber from morning to night. When did you arrive in Salas Pils? In Salas Pils, that was in, in the end of 1941. Uh, the end of nine, in the fall of 1941. Uh, so we did the best we could there. We lost a lot of weight, uh, but we, because we were young, we didn't get sick. But uh, one day, uh, the German uh, Air Force came to this camp, and they selected about eight, ten people 
out of this particular camp, which they wanted uh, for them to work there. So we all stood uh, in the, what you call this, in the free, uh, uh, where everybody is, has to stand at, at attention there and where people got selected. So they asked for, um, first of all, a, a tailor. That was the first thing they asked for. And then for auto mechanics and uh, for electrician, for carpenters, for cabinet makers, all people with the profession, what they asked for. So my friend Hans, he got selected as a cabinet maker. And I didn't get selected. And there was a lieutenant and a um, sergeant and two privates from the Air Force there. So this Hans goes to this uh, sergeant and he says, the best man you didn't select. Here, my friend here, he is a perfect carpenter. He knows the carpenter business in and out. And you left him behind. Oh, where is he? He is over there. This and this. He pointed at me and he said, that's him. So he called me over. And he says, you come along too. So they put us on the truck. And uh, we uh, got, were taken out of this, uh, out of this camp, Salas Pills. Can you tell us a little bit about, more about what it was like in Salas Pills? Yeah. Salas Pills was a camp where only young men had worked there. 16, 18 hours a day. Uh, there was no food. Uh, people died like flies. And every so often, new people were brought in to do the work there. And the work you were doing the was? The work was uh, taking lumber. In the, the barracks, uh, there's normally room for one people, four people were laying there. There was only straw. That was our uh, the only thing, no blankets, no nothing. But there were so many people in the barracks that it was the, created so much body heat, so there was no heat needed. And uh, in the morning when you woke up, you saw people next to you or across from you who died during the night. And if you saw a dead person, all you had to do is pull him on his legs and lay him in the middle. And then there was another commando who took the dead bodies out and they stacked them outside uh, until they were ready to bury them. And it was winter, they were frozen hard, and they were laying there for days and days and days, for weeks. So how long were you in Salas Pills before you went to the Air Force? I was in Salas Pills maybe for three months, the most, yeah. Was there any sort of medical care there for anybody? No, no. no. If, you, uh, if you reported you were sick or anything like this, that means uh, you're going to get shot. There was no, no medical. There was not even a bandage in this uh, camp. Nobody, nobody got sick in there. And if you were sick, you wouldn't say anything. So, uh, so you went to the Air Force? I went to the Air Force. I should go back to this camp one, once more time because I had an experience in this camp which I really should uh, mention. Uh, I made friends with another fellow who worked. Uh, when the transports arrived on the train stations, all the luggage was, not all, some of the luggage was sent to this camp and some of the people had to assort the luggage. There was, after the barracks were built, they had to assort the luggage. They took out the women's clothes, blouses to blouses, from men's shoes to shoes, eyeglasses to eyeglasses, and whatever. <coughs> and that was sent back to, <coughs> to uh, Germany. And one day, a young, young man came, he asked me, do you ever have any contact with an SS man or with anything like this? I said, no, I don't. And I got friendly with him. And a few days later, maybe a week later, he came to me. I was working then inside in the barracks, and he was carrying lumber. And he came back to me and he said, Fritz, I found somebody. He would like to have a tablecloth for his wife. So I gave him a tablecloth from 
and then I ordered his suitcases and he put it around his waist and put his um, uh, jacket over it and uh, they cut him and then they asked him, they asked him, where do you get this tablecloth from? How did you get a hold of this tablecloth? He wouldn't say anything. If he would have said anything, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Do you remember the name of this man? No. I don't, I've been trying so hard for many years. Uh, he was about my age at the time. And they took him, and we all had to go, and they shot him right on the spot there. And we had to look on, well, everybody, every time there was a shooting or a hanging, we had to look on when it was done. And they hit him, hit him, and they asked him where he got the tablecloth from. He wouldn't say it. If he would have mentioned it, I wouldn't be here anymore. So going back to the Air Force, the Air Force took us out of the camps. And how many were you that they took? How many men? There were about eight of us. They took us out. What this commando was, the Germans, they captured uh, anti-aircraft guns from the Russians. Um, and some of the prisoners had to repair them anti-aircraft guns, but there was a lot of sabotage done to them guns. And when the Germans fired the first shots, they, they was over on the sea, on the Baltic, Baltic Sea, they fired the shots in. Uh, then barrels exploded because of the sabotage. So they decided the soldiers won't fire the first shots anymore. We take prisoners to uh, fire the first shots. So this came to be known and the sabotage stopped and we were the people who fired the first shots on them and the aircraft guns into the, to the sea. So, and then in the, that wasn't all day, that was only for a few hours a day and then we had to go back. We had a, assigned, a place assigned to us. So one of the soldiers came to us and he says, I'm going on furlough. Uh, what's the chance of um, getting a suitcase from you people? Can't you make a box a suitcase? I have some extra stuff I would like to take along. Now we made him a nice suitcase, this Hans and I, we made him a nice suitcase, uh, which came out pretty good for what we had. So he said, fine. So the next soldier came and pretty soon more and more came. So we tried to make a business out of it. And I said, no, we can take you, you're ahead, somebody else is ahead of us. So we said, if you give us some bread or if you have some cigarettes, we'd be glad to put you ahead. So they came and they said, we give you a carton of cigarettes, take me first. Or I give you a loaf of bread, or I give you butter, or uh, I give you bacon. And then, so we did this for a while. But this didn't last very long. Uh, what, what, what year was this again? That was in 1942. 1942. Then we got transferred back to the ghetto. And uh, I saw my parents again. Then we worked out of the ghetto for a while. Were you living with your parents? Again? Yeah, I was living with my parents then. Uh, my parents, they were in the ghetto all the time. My father, he worked in the uh, in Riga. My mother worked in the hospital, in ghetto, inside of the hospital. And my father had to go uh, uh, to the, um, where they killed the cattle. Uh, and he worked there. Were they healthy? Yeah, they were pretty healthy up to then. Yeah, they were there, and my father could bring some meat, pieces of meat with him when he came home in the evenings, and it was all right up to then. One day, the ghetto got, uh, there came a lo uh, an order out that all ghettos had to be dissolved. When was this? That was in end of 42, beginning 43, 1943. So then it started to go downhill. So we had to work in a place called Mühlgraben. 
Mühlgraben was a place where the uh, German army sent all the uniforms from the soldiers who were killed on the front. They had to be repaired, washed and laundered and sent back again. And we had to do, there were men and women. So where was Mühlgraben exactly? Mühlgraben was by Riga, was uh, this camp inside of the city of uh, Riga, on the outskirts of Riga. And we did the work there for quite a while. My mother, she had to sew, was in the commando which sewed the uniforms. Uh, my father, he uh, transport on a cart the uniforms back and forth, and I was working in the laundry there, uh, uh, washing the uniforms. Uh, we were there until 1944. 1944, uh, there was an attentat of Hitler that was in July, the 28th of July, or the 20th of July, and the 20th of July, when the German officers tried to kill Hitler. My father was taken about a week later from every camp as uh, hostages, and they were taken away, and they were killed. Uh, I saw my father before he went, and he had one more gold piece on him from the one we found from the very beginning. And this last gold piece he gave me, and he said, here, you may need it better, more than I do. I said, no, you better take it with you. And uh, he did because I still had one, and we never saw them again. Later on, we found out that they were killed. They came to a camp by the name of Kaiserwald, which was quite famous in Riga, uh, where they took them away. Uh, I went through Kaiserwald. I had to work a while in this camp Mühlgraben, and and. Yeah, I had to work there for quite some time. And then the Russian advanced. They came closer and closer. You were still laundering? Yes, still doing the same work. Uh, the Russians came closer and closer. And then the Germans decided to send us back on a ship. Everybody was evacuated from Riga. So we went on a big, big boat, a big ship. Uh, it was a transport ship. And that's where I, by accident, I saw my mother for the last time. Uh, there was uh, quite a storm at sea, in the Baltic Sea. That was in uh, the fall of '44. There was quite a storm, and quite a few people got seasick, almost everybody. All the soldiers, there wasn't the soldier standing. Uh, the ship went way up and then bounced down again for a big ship like this. I never saw anything like it. I didn't get seasick, so they asked people who are not sick to go down to the women's quarters where the women were, and there were some buckets to empty out the buckets and clean up a little bit out there. Uh, so I happened to see my mother there, and then we went in the kitchen on this ship. They had uh, uh, pea soup cooking at the time, and we were flying around all over on this boat. The guns were flying over, overboard. The soldiers, they uh, put themselves uh, uh, on, uh, with their belts. They, they fastened them on the ship so they wouldn't go overboard. But they were laying there sick. And we went and had some of this pea soup to eat then in this uh, in the kitchen. Then I took a pot full and I carried it down to my mother, but she was so sick she couldn't eat anything. Now, finally, we came on in Danzig. Uh, 
yeah, this ship went to Danzig. In Danzig we were unloaded and we were put on small barges and no food, no nothing. And there I started to lose weight. And then we came into a camp that was called Stutthof. Stutthof was a camp with over a hundred thousand people in. People of all races, all nationalities, uh, anybody who did anything against the Nazi regime was in there. There were murderers in there. There were uh, homosexuals in there. Anything, any, anything was in there. Uh, Jews as, mu as well as non-Jews. Uh, when we arrived at the camp, they said, put us in a room, a big large room. They said, anything you have on, off, naked. We had to go naked. Uh, we had to spread our fingers. Was it men and women or just men? Just men. We had to spread our fingers and bend down and open our mouths. And I had one more piece, a gold piece. I took this gold piece and put it underneath my tongue. And uh, if they would have found it, I either would have swallowed it or whatever. But they didn't see it. And we went through, and they put us in the next room. There was shoes and pants and jackets and little round hats laying all in one bunch. We had to go by, and each one was an assessment standing with a whip. And we couldn't pick out the size or anything. We took a pair of shoes that was wooden shoes. Uh, we took a pants, we took a jacket, and we took a, a head, and we went and put it on. Either it was too small or too large, or if somebody was lucky, he had his size. So we interchanged. The ones uh, who needed small ones got small ones, the one who needed larger, until we found our right size. This camp, there was nothing to do. This crematorium in this camp was burning day and night day and night. And you knew? Oh yeah, we knew what was going on. But every day they used transports out of this camp. They asked for volunteers. The loudspeaker went day and night. There was barracks there. Before in Salas Pills we were maybe four people to a room which belonged. There there were six or seven. That was a really overcrowded camp. Uh, in the morning, we had to stand to be counted. Four o'clock, we had to go out. And the count never came out. By the time the count was over, was maybe 10 or 11 o'clock. And if you uh, were caught doing anything on the streets, uh, you had to go to the bathroom. You couldn't do this on the streets. There was one bathroom for thousands and thousands of people. So there was a line. You stood in line to go to the bathroom. That was my uh, pastime in this camp. I stood in line. By the time my turn came, I went to the bathroom. I went back to the end of the line to stay again until my turn came again, which took hours and hours. Uh, in the evening was the same thing. We had to stand to be counted. The count never came out. That started at 4 o'clock. And it wasn't over till 10, 11 o'clock, and you had to stand at attention all the time. In the afternoon, you got uh, your meal, which was uh, some water where potato peels were cooking in, and one slice of bread. Now, and then you had to go with this bread, you had to go, uh, uh, and you got some uh, marmalade on this bread. And that was uh, handed out with a knife. But the marmalade was so thin, it was like water. So the fellow who gave out the marmalade and your bread, he took the knife in. And by the time it came on your bread, there was nothing on it. So this marmalade, that, that was good for a week, a pot full of marmalade for all the people there. Uh, 
there was SS standing there, not that you start arguing, you didn't get anything or what, you wouldn't argue, you just kept on going. Uh, you found a place to eat your bread, uh, real careful, every crumb who fall down, that you didn't lose anything. People was fighting over this bread. Uh, they were fighting over the soup. Uh, everybody lost a lot of weight there. I lost an awful lot of weight in there too. I got acquainted with another fellow by the name of Kurt Mendel, who lives in Germany today, and we pretty much we were the same age, and we stuck pretty much together. Uh, I mentioned before this loudspeaker was going and asking for volunteers. They promised um, cigarettes and the same rationing as the German army. It didn't sound good. It didn't, nothing sounded good to us. One night, about 12 o'clock at night, they asked for about uh, 100 volunteers uh, to do some work for people to go out of the camp. They didn't promise a thing. They didn't promise no cigarettes. They didn't promise their rationing the same. Nothing. It was a very short message over the loudspeaker. Uh, the people are needed, the ones who, are, who want to go, come to the main gate. I said, Kurt, that sounds like that's something for us. Let's go. Let's take a chance. I said, let's get out of this camp. We went down to the main gate as fast as we could, and they took both of us. How long had you been in Stuttgart? Oh, in Stuttgart I was a few weeks, about a month, four or five weeks. You, uh, at this but point, this sounded like uh, five years, just five years. At this point, you never saw, did you see your mother? No, no. I'd never saw my mother again. You never saw, you don't know what it yeah, I, I found out later on through uh, other prisoners who were with my mother, and uh, she died of typhus, and she died very late. In, in uh, Most of the people got freed in March of 45, from over there, March and April of 45, and my mother died in February, a month before the people got freed. So we were taken, they took us on a... Um, big truck, and uh, they took us to another camp. The camp had no barbed wire around it. There were some small barracks there, about 10, 15 barracks, and we were the first 100 people to arrive at this camp. The name was Lauenburg. And do you know what it was near? Any, was it near? Mm, it wasn't too far away. It wasn't too far from Danzig. Uh, but going more towards Pommern, towards Poland in there. Uh, we were the first to arrive. There was an SS man, I can't recall his name, only one SS man who was in charge of the whole camp there. He said the first thing you have to do is put up barbed wires around the camp. He says if anybody escapes from this camp, there is no way for you to get any place or to can do anything. Uh, you, uh, you're going to be shot. And if you come back, 10 other people are going to be shot. We're going to find you if you run away. And nobody ever did run away. Uh, so we had the stand and we counted again. And then the SSS man came and he says, um, I need a tailor, first thing. So the one fellow. I'm a tailor. Okay, you come out, step forward. And then he asked a person who knows how to take care of horses. So I stepped forward. I says, I know how to take care of horses. And so he asked me why. I said, where I was born, there was a lot of horses. I worked with a lot of farmers and this and this. Okay, you're in charge of the horses. I figured, well, horses have to eat. At least they get water. Horses, at least they get beets or anything like this besides hay, they get something. And it's warm where the horses are. He says, you live with the horses, you sleep with the horses, you take care of the horses. That's your job. Fine. I did this and there was a wagon in the morning. I put the horses on the wagon and then the train station wasn't very far away. 
and all the food and anything that came into the camp was brought in with these horses and wagon. I was in charge of this. I went over to the train station and one day I had uh, potatoes on the wagon. There was a fellow I knew from Cologne and he was very, very hungry. He said, Fritz, Fritz, throw me a few potatoes. I'm so hungry. Please throw me some potatoes. And I threw him a few potatoes down and one of the capo, he is called, that's a Jewish, uh, he was in charge, Jewish police. He saw me doing it. What was his name? I can't recall. I cannot recall his name. He saw me doing it. He stopped me. He says, come on down. And he took me to the lager elderster, the, that's called the, Jewish uh, person who was in, in charge of the camp and they beat me up something first because they had friends which uh, they wanted a job for because it was considered a very, very good job. I was taken away from this. I was beaten up by them too. So you were beaten up by basically Jewish, the Jewish... Jewish uh, police, yeah. And uh, then the next day they said, you have to go to work to a commando where only people work who uh, have violations, who have any, who done anything wrong. I think we're going to take a break now. Okay. All right. We just were in Lauenburg where you had been disciplined by or beaten up by members of the Judenrat. Mm -hmm. Did you encounter any other sort of disciplinary actions against you? Actually, um, I was one of the first prisoners in this camp to be beaten up by this SS man. Um, I walked through this camp one evening and I had a piece of wood in my mouth. And this S.S. man called me over and he accused me of smoking a cigarette. I said, no, it was no cigarette. And I said, it was a piece of wood I had in my mouth. So he beat me up something first. And he says, I never want to see you again with anything in your mouth. Next time you open your mouth in front of me, you're going to be shot. And I left it at that. When, after you had been working with horses and you had been punished, what happened then? Well, after I was taken off of this commando, I had to work in a, as a commando to lay railroad tracks. And that was a commando where everybody who did something uh, was put in this commando. That was all prisoners with a mark against them. So, were they all Jewish prisoners? They were all Jewish prisoners. They, oh, older people, younger people, every, every age group was in this commando. Early in the morning, we were the first one to leave this camp and the last one to come back. Uh, the work was very hard and there was a lot of accident in this commando. There were the big railroad tracks. We weren't strong enough to carry them, but we had to. and. We were beaten up on it, and some people trapped the track, couldn't hang on to it, 
and they fall on somebody's feet or on their hands or whatever, and they got pretty badly hurt, the prisoners, and were, were, this type of work. Were, were there any sort of, sort of um, medical facilities there? No. no. No, there were no medical facilities whatsoever. Uh, the only medical facility was in the ghetto when we first arrived, and that was it. After this, if anybody was sick, that meant a bullet in your head. Uh, at this commando, there was a, a guard who was a German guard, not a Latvian or anything like this, was German. And one evening, we walked back to the camp and I had a habit of walking in the very, very last, uh, one of the last prisoners in this column. And I used to pick up cigarette butts on the street, and this guard was behind me. And one day he came and he says, how can you pick up them cigarette butts? You, who knows who had them in their mouths? I said, well, I uh, take them in the camp, and sometimes I give them to other prisoners and I get a piece of bread for it or whatever. So he said, God, you speak good German. Are you German? I said, yes, I was born in Germany. So he said, what are you doing here? How come you walk in this column with all them prisoners? I said, well, I'm Jewish. That's the reason I'm here. He said, what's Jewish? I never heard of a Jewish person. Are they different? I said, we must be. They put me here. Oh, so the next day, he called me. We went to work again, and he called me over. And he says, over there in this big drum, there is a sandwich for you. You go and get this sandwich. I says, no, no, I won't walk away from this column where we are working. I said, uh, you may shoot me after I'm gone, a few feet away. Because anybody who separated himself from the work column, automatically he got shot because they were under the impression the people would run away. I said, no, I won't do this. He says, well, I order you to go there. Then you go there right now. So I walked and I looked back every second while I walked there. And I went on this big, huge drum there and there was a sandwich laying there. God, I haven't seen one of them since before camp. So I started to eat it, and because I was very hungry, and I came back and I thanked them for it. Now a few days go went by, and I always was talking to him when we went back and forth uh, to work from the camp. So one day I had enough uh, courage to ask him, if he would mind, there was a German civilian worked real close by, not too far away, where we laid the railroad tracks. And uh, if he would mind if I go up there and see if they have some food left over, if I could bring it down. He said, no, go up there. And if they say anything, tell them I sent you. So I walked up and there was an SS man in the kitchen, and I stood at attention, and I asked him first if uh, he allows me to speak to him. He said, yeah, what do, you, what do you want? I said, well, if you have anything to do, what your people don't like to do, we would be glad to do it, and if you have any food left over, uh, we don't care what it is, uh, we would appreciate it. He said, well, after I feed the pigs, you can have what's left over. So uh, he said, uh, why don't you get a couple of people down there and you guys can clean where the pigs are, clean this up. So the food we, he gave us, that was all the scraps which were left over on the table. There were napkins in it, there were whatever the people left on their plates was scraped up in the barrel and we took this down I got help with other prisoners, we brought it down, and every day we got food from, the, from them people. And we had enough to eat there, so finally this commando was to be a punishing commando, and after a 
few months, it turned out that was one of the best commanders who left the camp because there was a lot of food there. Do so, you remember the name of this soldier by any chance? No, I wish I would. No, I don't. That's many, many years ago. Yes. So uh, uh, one day I was called by the this policeman, Capo. He asked me to come over. He says, I understand you're bringing food in the camp. I says, yes. I says, he asked me if we steal this food someplace. I said, no, we don't steal the food. I said, we are be getting it from there and there. And I explained to him what happened. So he says, well, tomorrow you bring some food for us. So reluctantly, I took food to him too. Otherwise, I would have maybe taken away from this commando or would have gotten beaten up again. So that went on for a while. And then the Russians came closer in this camp, Lauenburg. Uh, we had to leave. Uh, they put us in a different camp which was called Gotendorf Lanz. We had to walk to this camp. There were, there were no more trucks for us, nothing. How, how, how far away was this? That, I would say, we walked for about two, three days on this. And um, uh, there was no food, no nothing on the way to this other camp. We uh, got some sugar beets from the fields which were close by them, big, huge sugar beets. That's all we had to eat. Uh, we arrived at this camp, Godendorf Lanz, and I started to get sick. I really started. That was, on, I would say, 1945 now. What month about? That could have been in uh, February, beginning of February of 1945. Uh, one day I was so sick, and every day they counted the people. You had to stand outside, cold, hot, whatever it was. They counted you. Every day was counting, irregardless, in every camp. They counted and counted, and I was missing. Because I was so sick, I didn't care anymore, and I didn't go out. So uh, they searched. They found out that I was the one who was missing. Uh, they searched for me and they found me. They brought me out and there I really got beaten up. You were beaten up by whom? I was beaten up by the SS then. They put me over a, um, uh, a bench and they were standing on my feet in the back and they put my hands down. They tied them underneath the bench and they gave me about 20, 25 uh, over my naked rear, and my skin broke open, and it was bleeding, and I was in pretty bad shape. Uh, friends of mine helped me, because I always during the camp helped others, and I always had a lot of friends. I never made an enemy in the camp, because it would really come back to you. Uh, they helped me along, and one day people start running away and they didn't do, the SS didn't do anything about it anymore. They didn't care anymore because the Russians came closer and closer and closer. So people were es escaping from the camp? Right, they were escaping. The ones who were healthy and could get away, they escaped because we could hear the, the cannon fire coming closer and closer. So they evacuated us from this camp camp and we had to march. So they put us on a march which lasted about a whole week. Now, to backtrack for one minute, uh -huh. you mentioned that you had um, many friends. Right. Do, do you remember their names? Or Oh yeah, I remember some of them. I mentioned some of them. Kurt Mendel is one of them. Walter Schmitz is another one. He just passed away. He was living in New York. Paul Kaufman, he passed away already. He was living in New York. Heinz Behrmann, who is still alive, he lives in uh, Chicago right now. And, and when, when they did 
what type of, how did you live out your friendships with each other? What specifically did they do to help you? Um, well, when we were on this march, they actually carried me along. I had my arms over their shoulder, uh, over the one on the left side, one on the right side, and they kind of dragged me along. Because anybody who was falling behind, the SS was in the end, they shot everybody who couldn't walk anymore. So and we knew this, so they dragged me along. One day, we came to a small farming community, and we were put in a big, huge barn. And we could hear the, the shots from the Russian, the, the cannons, and whatever, the firing from gunfire, we could hear, or hear already. The Russians were real close by. When we were in this barn there, about four o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden a Russian tank came and broke this door down, just rammed this door, and the door collapsed in the inside, and all the prisoners who were laying there, they were killed the last day. This tank backed up, and uh, the soldiers came, the Russian soldiers came, some of them spoke a little German, and some of the prisoners spoke Russian. There were Russian prisoners and Polish uh, prisoners with us. They s got along with the language, and they said, from now on, you are free. Whatever you see, whatever you want is yours. You are, you are free people. And um, the fighting is this direction, and you go the opposite direction. There is no more fighting. So what, what was the approximate date? That was on March the 10th, 1945. That was the day I got freed. And uh, so at this day, a lot of the prisoners killed themselves. They either jumped out a window or they just ran in front of a tank and got the, they, they went over them. Uh, they couldn't take it. It came too sudden. Did you see you, this? Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw this. At, uh, this. This came too sudden. People couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, you were for four or five years, four and a half years, you you had to follow orders, you, you didn't have no food and nothing, and all of a sudden it was given to you. How did you feel? Um, How did it I kind of lost my mind myself. I didn't know anymore what I was doing. I uh, uh, f was fighting. There was a, a Germans, they ran away and they left everything they had there. And there was a whole bag and full of cigarettes. And I went on this wagon and a woman had a carton of cigarettes in her hand. And I was fighting with her to get the cigarettes. She says, what are you fighting with me for? There is a whole wagon full. I said, no, I want yours. No, I want yours. And we were fighting over this carton of cigarettes. Um, and some of the people started cooking. And they went in the houses in this little town there, and they found blueberries and anything the people can't in the houses there. So um, they start handing this out. And I got a hold of a jar of blueberries, which were canned, and I ate this whole jar of blueberries. And I weighed at the time 75 pounds. That was my weight, and that was the worst thing I could have done. There was no supervision. Uh, when the Americans freed the prisoners, what I found out, uh, they took care of them right away. They put them in hospitals, and see, but the Russians didn't. The Russians said, go, anything you see is yours, you are free, do what you want. And the townspeople evacuated the area? Yeah, there weren't very many townspeople. They all, they all their towns were empty when the Russians came. The, Ger the Germans there, they were afraid of the Russians very much so. And uh, so, it was late in the afternoon, that was early in the morning when this all happened. And I did the best I could. I saw the horses running around and chaos all over. So I thought, I don't want to walk anymore and I can't walk anymore. And so I took two horses and I wanted to put them in a small buggy 
and I did made it all ready and somebody else came who was stronger than me. He took the horses and he went off. So I found two other horses and I put them on a big hay wagon. And I said, well, it's better than, than walking. A bad ride is better than a good walk. I put them on, put them horses on, I climbed on top of this wagon and I was ready to go the directions the Russians showed us which way to go. And I looked around, there were about 20, 25 women behind me on this wagon, prisoners, all prisoners. No, I didn't say anything. We all went together and we drove almost this late, late in the evening with into a different town with the horse and wagon. When we arrived at this town, everybody separated, everybody went their own way. I took the horses and put them in the barn and said, tomorrow morning I'm going to take the horses and keep on going. I went in this house inside and laid down on the floor. Early in the morning I went out, my horses were stolen, my horses were gone. No? That really affected me and then I kind of gave up. I said, oh, what's the use? So I went back in the house and I laid down and I really got sick. I broke out with typhus and I had typhus really bad. And I was laying in this house, I don't know how long, was laying on the floor and while I was laying there, all of a sudden a Russian soldier came and he kind of with his foot uh, turned me over. He wanted to see if I was dead or alive. And I kind of looked at him with big eyes. And he looked at me and he grabbed me with one hand and he carried me outside in a jeep. And he put me in the back of the jeep and he drove. Oh, the roads weren't very good. And I got awful sick then. Finally he stopped and he went to a house where Germans were in. He looked for them. He went to different houses. And, wh and what, you were in what country at this point? That was in uh, Poland then. That's Poland today. Uh, he told the Germans, if he dies, I come back. I'm going to shoot all of you. You take care of him. And he spoke half. German, they could understand it, they were very much afraid. They took me, they washed me, they gave me food and I was with them people for about three, four weeks and finally I could walk again, barely. I had a couple of sticks I walked with and the war wasn't over yet. And I said, well, I can't stay there forever. Do you remember their name? No. I can't stay here forever and I went on my way and I went through houses which were empty. The Russians went through them already but I was looking for food. Russian soldiers, they were looking for, for other things. Were you, now, where do you know approximately where this was? What that town wasn't or? too far from Stolp in Pommern, that's, which is uh, Poland today. and. Uh, I went through them houses and looking for food and one day uh, two Russian soldiers came. He said, put your hand up, you're a Nemetsky, Nemetsky. Nemetsky is uh, Russian, that's uh, German. That means German, you're a German, German soldier. I said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not German, I'm not. Yeah, you're a German soldier, you're a German soldier, put your hands up. They put me against the wall and they pointed a gun at me. So one of them left the room and went through the house looking for things and he called uh, his buddy over. I don't know what they found. I took this moment and I ran out of the house. I ran across the street and I went into another house which was empty and went upstairs and there was a big wardrobe there upstairs. I opened up the doors and then freestanding wardrobe. I opened up the doors, I went inside and I let this wardrobe fall down right on top of me. And I was laying there the whole night and I heard them Russian soldiers going from 
house to house, firing shots, looking for me, looking for me. No? The next morning, early afternoon, I said, I got to get up, I got to get out of here. So I crawled from underneath there and I went out on the street. I wasn't two minutes on the street. And put your hands up, stop. So I did. They took me in and they took me to a commandant there, a Russian commandant. And um, he asked me if I was German. I said, no, I'm not a German. I said, I was in the concentration camp. Uh, I said, I was born in Germany. Oh, then you're a German. Then you're a German. I said, no, I'm not German. I said, I come out of the concentration camp. Now, finally, he believed me. And he said, OK, you start working here. So I worked there for a little bit. I couldn't do much work. And finally, he gave me permission to go on. So I went on, and I went to Stolp, which was a big city. Now, then you realized that you were Jewish then. Oh, yeah. He must have. That comes, uh, and um, so on the way to Stolp, while I was walking towards Stolp, I found uh, two girls who came out of the camp. They were very sick in a house where I was looking for food. They were laying there. And uh, I brought them food, and I stayed there for one day, and then I left. And finally, I arrived in Stolp. And I went to the commandant there in Stolp. And he asked me where I came from, what I wanted to do. Fine. So I worked in the slaughterhouse in Stolp uh, with the Russians. Now, the Russians, they, some of them didn't know how to ride a bicycle. And they had bicycles. I taught them how to ride a bicycle. Uh, they wanted to kill some cows which were pregnant, pregnant cows. And they had other cows which uh, were uh, cows uh, for slaughtering. And they couldn't tell the difference on this. So I told them, no, don't kill this cow. This one has to be killed. And I helped them kill the cows and so I was there for quite some time. In the evenings, we went on riots, the Russian soldiers. I spoke then a few words. I picked up a few words uh, Russian. And uh, there was one fellow there, a Russian, who spoke pretty good German. We went on a, uh, this uh, uh, big truck. There were about eight, ten soldiers. They gave me a, a gun, too. And we were going into the German houses. So first of all, they looked for sugar, they looked for whiskey, and they looked for bacon. That was the main thing they were interested in. So and they told me, when the Germans talk, you know what they are talking about. And then if there is something there, we stay and we find it. And if there isn't anything, we go to the next house. Now, we went to the houses, and the Germans, uh, the Russians asked the German people, um, do you have sugar? Sugar? No sugar. And then I could hear when they were talking to each other, oh, I sure hope they don't find it, or it's where did you hide it? It's hidden there and there. So, and then I know, and then I said, well, we stay, we look for it. And then we found radios, sometimes we found guns, and sometimes we found the sugar, sometimes we found wine, whatever. So, I came in pretty handy to the Russians. What month was this? What that month was was uh, oh, in the summertime, May, June, July, 45. So there was also a lot of uh, the Germans, they brought a lot of people from Russia to work, private people, in Germany. And they spoke, spoke fluent uh, Russian and German. So there was one girl I got acquainted with, and the commandant called me in one day, and he said, uh, tomorrow a train is going to uh, Odessa, and you're going to be on the train, we're going to send you to the officer school in Odessa. 
and you're going to join the Russian army. So I told this to the girl, and she says, God, you don't want to go to Russia. You never get out of there. You don't want to go there. And I had duty at the same evening, a guard duty, on the main entrance. So this girl came and brought me civilian clothes. I changed. I left my gun and the uniform they gave me in the guardhouse, and I ran through t uh, to the train station in Stolp. And uh, there were German uh, people which went back to Germany, and there was whole train loads full. Now, when you were amongst the Russians, did uh -huh. they consider you... Wh how did oh, they as their buddy. As their buddy, as right. part of... Uh, part of them. Part, yeah, of them. part of them. And do you remember the name of this young woman that no, was... No, I, I can't recall the name. So I went in, uh, in the train station, and uh, I went in with the Germans, and I made off like I was a German. I was on my way back to Germany, too, uh, as a displaced uh, German. And I spoke uh, Germans with them, like, oh, where did you come from? I asked them, and then I cut on. I said, well, I come from the same place, and we never met. Finally, this train was going too slow for me. It stopped, and the military trains went through. So, one train station, I, when the train stopped, I saw a military train, Russian military train standing there. I said, oh, I go in there. This train is going to Berlin. That's, I'll be there in a day or two. And this way, it takes me maybe a whole week to get there. So I'm sitting on this train. The military train was ready to go. And all of a sudden, two Russian soldiers came with a red armband on, and NKVD, the police, secret police. Look, come on out. Who are you? How come you're on this train? Told them. Yeah, they wouldn't believe me. Let's go to the commandant. Oh, okay, to the commandant. Mm. I was tired of saying that I was a German. Then I said, I'm French. I came from France. Oh, you come from France. That's very interesting. Where did you live in France? So I said, I lived in Paris. What was your address? I said, Rue de Pelican. And that was an address my aunt used to live there. And I remembered this name. He said, Rue de Pelican, hmm, very interesting. Well, if you're French, why don't you speak French to me? I understand French. So I said, okay. I said, Baruch Atoadanoi, Eloheinu Melech Olam. He said, that isn't French. He says, I understand this language too, that's Hebrew. How come you're lying to me? I says, well, if you understand Hebrew, I can tell you the truth. I says, yes, I was lying. I says, I was born in Germany. I'm Jewish. I come from Jewish parents. I was in the concentration camp. Nobody believes me. Whenever I run into a Russian, they say I'm an escaped German uh, from the military, German military. I said, that's the only language I speak is German and a few words of Hebrew. So he said, well, I understand your sh story. He said, from now on, you don't have to lie anymore. He says, I give you papers, which every s Russian soldier can read, and you keep them papers, and you have free sailing. So he gave me the papers, and I ran into a few more Russians. All I did is show this paper this uh, commandant gave me. Oh, fine, the street is open, you go. Do you remember the name of the commandant? No, oh. no, no. So finally I came on in Berlin, and that was late in the fall. Uh, I came uh, out of the train station, and I saw a postman. I says, um, can you tell me, are there any Jewish people around here? Anybody who is Jewish, do you know of anybody? No, I really don't, but there is a woman who's living not too far over there in an apartment. I don't know if she is Jewish or not, but this is a good person to ask. No, I went to 
where he told me, knocked on the door. She opened the door. I said, can you direct me? Is there any Jewish people? Is there any organizations, uh, uh, churches, uh, any clubs where Jewish people are? Oh, yeah, there and there and there and there. Now, a few buses were running in Berlin. Berlin was terribly bombed out. I went on the bus. They said, ticket, please. I said, what? You have to pay. I says, I have to pay? I says, I throw you off the bus. I says, I'm a Jew. I came from the concentration camp. I says, I should kill you for you asking me for money. Where should I get the money from? Oh, 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 that's fine, that's fine. You just go. Finally, I came on to this place where she told me, and I saw a lot of my friends from the camp. Saw a lot of people I knew. That was a gathering point there, where the people could come and they helped them, they gave them food and so on. Who, who was helping them? That was a Jewish organization. So now my friends, they had hands full of money. God, and I had nothing on. I had torn clothes on, not a penny in my pocket. I said, God, how do you people get this money so fast? They had rolls of money in the end. Oh, black market. I says, what do you mean, black market? What's black market? Oh, there's the Alexanderplatz in, here in Berlin. Everybody meets there, everybody. The Russians, the French, the Germans, the Americans. Anybody who is anybody goes to Alexanderplatz and starts trading. We show you, you come with me tomorrow. Okay, next day we went to the Alexanderplatz. No, they were trading, they were buying cigarettes and coffee and cameras and stockings, everything but anybody wanted was uh, traded back and forth. And there was Allied money then. Allied money was different than German money. I'm going to get into this a little later on. So I said, God, how can I start? How can I start to make some money here? Finally, I found a German woman with a Russian soldier. The Russian soldier wanted to buy a camera from the German woman, and they didn't get together. So I asked the Russian how much he wanted for, uh, how much he wants to pay, and I asked the woman how much she want for the camera. I added 50 marks on it. I exchanged it. I took the 50 marks and ran away. Gave him the camera. He gave her the money. Now I had 50 marks, so I went to an American soldier, and I bought a pack of cigarettes. Chesterfield, I never forget it. Bought a pack of Chesterfield for 50 marks and I put them in my pocket and I sold one cigarette after the other. Then I had enough money to buy two packs and pretty soon I had enough money to buy a carton and so on and pretty soon I had a few, a little money in my possession. So one evening we were in this um, place and we were talking together, and one of my friends said, Fritz, let me see your hands. Take your shirt off. Take your shirt out. Let me see your, your body there. You have the crets. I said, what? That's highly contagious, what you have. That's a sickness. We all can get it. And oh, I said, please don't say anything. Don't say anything. No, 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 no. And they called the people who were in charge. They came over, oh, right away in the hospital. They took me in the hospital in Berlin, and I really was broken out all over. The skin you just could peel off of my hands. And, and what was wherever. it called? In German, you call it Kretz. I don't know what the English word is for it, but it's highly contagious, and your skin peels off, and wherever the clothing is tight, and your body, that's where you get it. So they put me in a bathtub, and that was black, black oil, and nothing was exposed in my face. And I had a later from morning till evening, and finally I got rid of it. In the evening I had to take baths, and the morning over again. Finally I got rid of it, I went back to the people I knew, 
We did a little bit more Alexander Platz or Black Market, if you want to call this. And finally, I had enough of this. So I said, well, I have to go back where I was born. I have to go back first to Cologne. So I went over to the American sector in Berlin, and I registered with the American army. And then uh, I was interrogated for about a whole week from the Americans. The same story. Where do you come from? Who was your father? Who was your mother? What camp were you in? What did you do? How come you are so late? Everybody is back already six, eight months. When was this? That was in late in the fall of 1945, in September, October. Uh, how come you are so late in the day? I was sent from one to another, from one officer to another officer. And finally, I, they kept me in this camp, and they gave us food, there was no shortage on anything. And they said, when your name appears on a big blackboard, that's the day we take you over um, to the English sector. Now, one day my name came up, I was put on a big truck, I never saw a truck this big, uh, American soldier, they drove through the Russian sector and into Berlin until I got to Hanover. In Hanover, another fellow and I, we said, well, that's enough. We, they wanted to put us in a camp there and say, you stay a few days in the camp until you feel good and then you can go. And I said, no, I don't want to go to a camp. I said, come on, let's go. We speak the language. They all speak German here. So we went by ourselves. Our money was gone. We spent it in the meantime. So we went to the Bürgermeister in a small town there. And I said, we come from the concentration camp. We are Jewish people. We need money. And please give us money. And he did. He gave us money. So then we went on the train station. I wanted to go to Cologne. The train was full of people on top, hanging on the sides, in, inside, full, full with people, all Germans. So we went in, I said, up, I'm a Jew, I come from the concentration camp. I says, you get up, I sit down. Boy, and they all were afraid of us. They all were very much afraid of us. So the, finally I came to Cologne, and uh, my friend was living there, Hans Behrmann, the one I mentioned before from the camp of Salaspils. We went together in the camp from Cologne. And I went uh, to the Jewish uh, uh, organization there in Cologne. There were quite a few people back then already. And I said, where is Hans Behrmann? Oh, Hans, he is well off. He lives there and there in one of the nicest uh, parts of the town. He has a beautiful apartment. You should see him. So I made my way. I knew Cologne. And I made my way to, to his apartment. I came in. No Hans. Nobody was home. He was living on the first floor. I said, well, he has to come sooner or later. And I was sitting on the steps. They're waiting for him to come. About two, three hours later, he and another friend from the camp, they came. He looked, he looked at me, he started hollering, I started crying, he started crying. He says, you're dead. Everybody's saying you're dead. You didn't come through. You didn't make it through the camps. And we hugged each other, and he said, come in. He says, how do you look? He says, where do you get them rotten clothes from? All torn up. He says, go and take a bath. I took a bath. He had a beautiful apartment, and he had a, the closet full of clothes. He says, pick out what you want. Pick out what you want. I dressed up. I says, how do you get this so fast? Oh, he said, that was easy. When I came on in Cologne, he says, I've been here now, but eight months. I went to the Bürgermeister in Cologne. I says, I come back from the camp. When we went to the camp, we had to leave everything in the apartment. We couldn't take a thing out. 
He said, I want it back. I want you to give me a list from the SS people you have. He said, I went around and I found somebody who was my size and my figure. And I went in, I took a policeman with me, and I says, out. I says, you remember when you took the Jews out? I'm going to kick you out. Don't you come back to this apartment. If, I, if you come back here, I'm going to kill you. You could do this at the time then. He kicked them out, and he had all his clothes and everything. So I was with him for a few days. Finally, I said, I have to go to my hometown where I was born. Why? Well, I wanted to see if my parents came back, if anybody came back from my family, uh, aunts, uncles, uh, cousins. I lost a lot of aunts, a lot of cousins. See, my age, I, uh, my parents, and I was searching for them at the time then. Uh, there was nobody there. I came on on this little train station with a train. First of all, from Cologne, I went with a car with a friend of mine to another town, and I was there for a couple of days. And then I took the train down to this small town, Laubenheim. I uh, got off the train station. There were two people, one woman and me, who arrived at the train station. This woman was the Bürgermeister Schnell, his wife. And she couldn't believe it when she saw me. She says, God, now do we get better? He was a Bürgermeister under the Nazis. And for a moment she spoke to me and he says, are you going to do anything against us? I says, no. I says, I won't forget what your husband did for us. I says, uh-uh. I says, I protect you. Afi had so much trouble and so much bother because my husband was Bürgermeister. And I said, I know you didn't do anything which I know of. I don't know what you did when I was in the camps. I can't protect you against this. So the people were very much surprised when I came back. And you were how old at this point? I was 21 then. And uh, I was in this little town for a few days. People invited me for dinners, farmers, and some of them came who didn't sp speak to me when the Hitler time war. They came and wanted to sh shake my hand. I refused. I says, don't you come close to me. I says, you didn't know me then. And so from there I left to the next larger town which is called Bad Kreuznach. That was about 10 miles away. So I went to the governor who governed the several uh, uh, communities in Germany. And he happened to know my grandparents. Do you remember his name? No. Okay. Graf. His name was Graf. Yes, his name was Graf. Uh, he happened to know my grandparents, who also got killed in the camps. And he says, well, I'd be glad to help you. What can I do for you? I says, first of all, I haven't got no money. I says, I need money. Oh, that's no problem. He called the secretary in. He says, out of the emergency fund, give him some money. And then I said, well, I have to do something. I says, I, I would like to work for the for you here, if at all possible. He says, well, what do you know? I says, well, I know cattle. I know meat. So he said, well, there is a job, but the job is given out to a German person who has this job. But I think you get along with him. And what I'm going to do with you, there are about 30 or 40 butchers in this uh, district here. And they all have to bring their rationing uh, carts in and as many carts as they bring, that's as much meat they're getting. He says, you would be responsible. You go out with the policeman. You go from community to community. The farmers have to bring their cattle. Uh, and you pick out what you need, 
and you take the cattle and give them to the butchers. You can, you have to judge how much they weigh, pretty close, and you give it to them. Oh, I said that's a wonderful job. Yes. So, the fellow who had the job, his name was Perryman. He acquainted me with him. And this uh, governor told him, I says he is in charge, and if he wants you to work with him, uh, you can do so. Now, I didn't know too much. I didn't know as much as I made off I did. I needed this Perryman real bad. So we went outside. I says, listen, I says, I'm not going to take your job away. I says, we work together. Oh, fine, wonderful. And we got along very good. Now, I was in charge then. and I uh, gave the farmers the meat. And finally, I came to... Uh, Finally, I came to a butcher. He said, um, you know, you come over tonight for dinner. All right. I went to his house, and he says, you know, you're doing it wrong. If you give me a little bit more meat than I give the carts, I give you some of the meat back. You need meat. You, you need a car. You need clothes. You need furniture. You can't get this with money only with meat. So I got acquainted with him and uh, I did a little bit of business with him and I was in Germany then until 1950 and in 1950 I decided to leave Germany and come to the United States. So I left in August uh, the 8th, 1950. Did you have a sponsoring family? Yes, I had a sponsoring family. Uh, which was my uncle, who was living, who was living in Seattle, and uh, he sponsored me. And I went. Uh, I registered to come here to the United States in Germany. And in Rastatt, Germany, I had to go to the consul, the American consul. He said, "Yeah, everything is fine, but I want to tell you a little bit about America." I says, "Okay." In German, he spoke. He says, in America, people go with shine shoes. They have clean clothes on, clean fingernails, combed nice. That's a wonderful country, especially where you go to the Northwest. That's even better. I says, OK. I says, I can adjust to this. I says, I, I'm not a dirty person. I says, I have shine shoes and I have clean fingernails. That's good. He says, are you willing to fight for the country if this country ever goes to war? I said, sure. You swear to this? Yes. So he said, OK, here are your papers. You are free to go. I came on in New York. I left Bremerhaven August 1st, 1950. I looked around. I said, goodbye, Germany. I never want to see you again. I said to myself, Fritz, forget about the times you had. In the five years after, I wa after the camp, I was in Germany, I really had a wonderful life. I, had, I wanted to make up for things I lost. I was young. I, I, I really had anything a person could desire. I says, when I was on the ship, I looked around. I says, forget everything you had. I says, you come to America, you are nobody. You forget that you are in the camps. F don't feel sorry for yourself. Go to work and change your life. I came on. I was in New York City. I never was so disappointed when I see the harbor there. I came on in the harbor. The dirt, the filth, everything laying around on the street. My aunt picked me up. I was there for a few days. I had an aunt there. I says, no, I can't stay in this city. People and people and people. I says, no. I says, I'm going to keep on. And I see my brother who lives in Chicago. Chicago was worse. There was so hot up there in August. I couldn't stop drinking soda pop. So I said, no. He said, I got a job for you. 
I got a job all lined up. They pay you $2.50 an hour, which was good money then, uh, which was really good money. I said, no, I can't stay. I says, I go to Seattle. I says, and if I don't like Seattle, I says, I'm going to leave the United States. I'm going to go to Australia because I have a lot of friends in Australia. Now I came on in Seattle by train, 8 o'clock in the morning. My aunt picked me up. I never saw a city so beautiful than Seattle. I really fall in love. When the train came in, small houses, nice yards, flowers, clean. I went down Yeslevy. I saw the water, a big boat sitting in the water, and I love fishing. So I said, that's, that's for me. This town is for me. So uh, I stayed here, and I got married. They have three wonderful children. When did you get married? I got married in 1952, January the 10th. Two? To Esther. Chiprut was her name then. And we have a wonderful life. And we have, uh, three, have three wonderful children. And I have five grandchildren now. And what, and what do you do for a living? Or uh, what type of things do you do? I'm in the meat wholesale business. I have been for the last 20 years, and it's very successful. I supply restaurants and hotels and institutions. I have about 30 people working for me. What's the name of your company? The company's name is Meat Distributors, and it's located in Kirkland. What are your children's names? My children, the oldest one is Erna, uh, named after my mother. The second one is Vivian, and the third one is Susan. And you have five grandchildren. And I have five grandchildren, right? Um, have you t have you told your family? Have you told your children about your experience? My children are very much informed, right? Yes, they are informed pretty much about my life. You seem to be quite successful. And before you said that you didn't have um, a very extensive education in Europe, can you tell us a little bit about? Um, and you're very active in the Jewish community as well here. Well, in, when uh, Right before we went into the camp, I uh, mentioned I went to Hasharan. Hasharan is uh, where they uh, prepare you, but not alone for Israel. They prepare your whole life. I learned more in this one year I was up there. I learned uh, to speak correctly. I, I learned to write. I didn't. I was very bad in grammar. Uh, I learned about. Uh, Quite a few things. How many people were with you, and what organization sponsored it? That was um, the Maccabees was the name of the sponsor. And there were about a hundred people in this camp, right? And this is my story. Do, could any um, people join that, that the Hachshara program, the, At the, the time then, preparation yes. program? Yes, yes. And did any uh, of those people, some of those people went to They Palestine? all went to Israel. And when I was in Israel a few years back, I tried to look some of them up. I didn't find anyone. Right. Uh -huh. um, if you, is, is there anything that you've forgotten to speak about that you would like to bring up now? Well, there's quite a few things. Uh, uh, you know, I, I could be sitting here for hours and hours and tell really incidents which happened to me. But in general, I, I went through uh, the time in the camp and the time I was in Germany, uh, I would say, on a broad basis. If you could leave a message for future generations about your experience in your life, what right. would it be? What would it be? I says, be good to your fellow man. Don't let him go hungry. That's one thing. And I can't stand it today. I'm uh, very active in, in giving. I'm a great giver uh, to people who are hungry. And uh, I think if I see somebody on the street who's hungry, that's uh, very sad to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. Uh -huh. It's been an honor. Okay. Thank you for having me. What he's saying, yes. Okay. So you need both audio. Except I'm not putting the thing in my ear. You yeah, you know what you need to do? Because I'm not going to be hooked up to you. Yes? Okay. Uh, I, I can talk. I can say audio. the picture you see here. It's my Wait, he has to <laughs> clue you in. When? I can talk.
and we're ready again. The picture you're seeing here is the house I was born in. It was a quite large house. You see first our dog, Reno, my father, and then me sitting on the stone, my mother and my brother. And uh, riding on top of there, colonial one, that means groceries, cigar and tobacco, and cigarettes from M. Con. That's what my mother his business was. And you see the Maggie uh, advertising on the door there, on the big drawer. Okay. And when was this picture taken? Oh, this picture was taken in the early 30s. I would say uh, 19... They were waiting to advance. Yeah, and this is the... The picture you're seeing here is the village, the small farming community, uh, Laubenheim and the Nauer. And the river you see is called the Nauer River. And in the circle, that is the house next to the church. Um, the people who lived in this town, they were 99% uh, of uh, Christian Lutheran. Uh, the church is a Lutheran church. And your house was? Uh, our house was where the circle is, right next to the church, across from the church. This picture here is the modern Cologne, Cologne the way it is today. It was rebuilt, it was totally bombed out from the uh, Allied forces. And uh, this is the Rhine River and the bridges who go over the river. And in the middle of the picture, you see the famous dome, the dome from Cologne, which is a, a very famous. And this is me in my younger years. Uh, I wish I would look like this today. What year was this taken? This uh, picture was taken about uh, 40 years ago. How old were you? Oh, I think I was in my 20s, late 20s. Uh -huh. yeah. And this is a picture which was taken in the uh, g um, ghetto, in the Riga ghetto. You see the uh, woman in the middle, she is eating, uh, and I don't know the people's name, I don't know who they are. What year do you think uh, this picture was that taken? That must have been taken in 19. Uh, uh, 42. And how did you get this picture? This picture was given to me from a, uh, later when I came to Germany from a soldier who was in Riga. He had this picture. And, and this was from what ghetto? That was from the Riga ghetto. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Here's a closer look from the, this woman who's eating soup, or I'm sure it was no stew or T-bone steak. Um, you, s you said there was a story that you wanted to tell us a bit about. Yeah, I should come back <coughs> to a story which uh, happened in the camps, in one of the camps I was. You know, whenever uh, the people who were in charge, police, or whatever, in one camp, and they get transferred to another camp, they were nothing. They were ordinary prisoners. And if you hit on corners, if you made enemies in one of the camps, you really got paid back in another camp. And the story goes like this. I saw this with my own eyes. <coughs> the fellow who was in charge of the police in this camp, he came to another camp people had it in for him. In this camp, the facilities, the toilet, there were no toilet facilities. There was a room, uh, there was a, uh, a people dug a hole 
in the ground, I would say about 10, 15 feet deep and about 20 feet across and about 30 feet long. And then there were two by fours on top, and that's where you were sitting, and you had to do your toilet uh, business uh, there. So one day, this fellow who was a policeman, he was sitting there, and another prisoner came by and just gave him a shove, and he fall over right into the hole, and he never was seen again. Um, that was a way of uh, paying back if you made enemies. And this was at what camp? In which camp? That was in a, in a camp called uh, uh, Kaiserwald, by Kaiserwald. And you saw this? Yeah. That was a camp. I only was in this camp for one and two or two days, and I did not uh, uh, talk much about this camp. But uh, I should tell this story. And I always uh, tried not to make an enemy. You, you could not afford it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.